What's up, everybody? This is Alex Christopher with The Duran, and I'm here once again with Alexander Mercurius, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran.com. And today we're going to be talking about why Russian President Vladimir Putin decided to stick with his team. Alexander, thanks for joining us again. Uh, today you're going to discuss an article that you actually penned uh, for the Duran, which you titled, Why Putin Chose to Stick with His Team. And a lot of this uh, article focuses on a, a pretty uh, fiery debate that a lot of people who are interested in Russia and Russian politics uh, take part in. And that debate has a lot to do with the liberals that are in the Russian government, uh, the mm -hmm. fifth column that many people believe has, has infiltrated the, the top ranks of, of the Kremlin and uh, exerts a lot of influence and is there to overthrow this uh, this conservative, uh, traditional government of Putin. And now that uh, the Kremlin's, uh, Putin's team has been assembled, uh, many people are, are praising it. Many people are angry and upset about it. You, uh, you wrote a very detailed article explaining why Putin decided to stick with many of his core members uh, of his team, including uh, Dmitry Medvedev and uh, the reasons for doing so. And you also, I don't want to say debunk, but you explain exactly what's going on with this fifth column in the Kremlin and, and the liberal uh, influence within the Kremlin and how it affects Putin and the Russian government's decision. So Alexander, explain to us exactly why Putin decided to stick with his team and explain to us exactly your thoughts and views as to the fifth column uh, the Western liberal infiltration of the Kremlin, the debate that goes on about this. Right, let's still deal first with his team. The reason he stuck with his team, and he did, basically all the people that uh, are important in the government, the people who really matter, the people who run the various economic ministries, the, the finance ministry, uh, the people who run the foreign, uh, foreign ministry, the defense ministry, the reason he stuck by them is because they are good at what they're doing. They've successfully taken the country through a very difficult and challenging time economically, and they are loyal to him. <laughs> I think that is the, uh, it is the last point that I think is where a lot of the confusion comes. I think people see these people, people like Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, people like Finance Minister Anton Silvanov, and they see people who are in some respects, economic liberals, they believe in uh, economies where price and prices are determined by uh, uh, demand and supply, they s defend private property rights, they do all of these things. It, and ex ex Explain to us real quick, just before you go further, Alexander, why people, the difference between an economic liberal and how many people may get it confused with, with a, a neoliberal or a liberal uh, ideology. Right. The point about these people is that their liberalism extends no further than economics. And when one is talking about liberalism, one is talking about old fashioned 19th century uh, liberalism, capitalist liberalism, running an economy according to classical lines. These people are not political liberals in the sense that they are not supporters of the US and of the neoliberal policies of the US. They don't want massive uh, marketization of everything. They are not into identity politics at all, US identity politics. They are in most respects actually rather conservative people also. Um, you talked about a traditional conservative government. They are traditional conservatives and they run a traditional conservative economic policy, which is a classical liberal policy. It's the kind of classical liberal policy that Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, those sorts of people would have recognized as classical liberal. It is not in any conceivable sense a modern neoliberal uh, uh, economic policy which believes in letting free markets uh, in, the, in the financial sector loose, that believes in letting derivatives take control of everything. They're not into that. But I think that creates a lot of confusion because people see these two different things and they mix them together. 
because our political language, our language to describe these things, has not yet evolved sufficiently to do it properly. Right. So going back to what you were you, what you were explaining, so a lot of people see these 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 people in and around Putin who are uh, traditional uh, liberal economists in a traditional in a classical sense, as you said, and they get it confused with people who are in the in the Kremlin to infiltrate uh, the Putin government. Um, but you see them as as very loyal to to Putin and 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 his traditional. Uh, I'll say traditional ideology, um, as well as his his classical liberal uh, economic policies. I think that's exactly right. I mean, one of the points about my article is that I quote extensively from the Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, who is often considered to be the leader of this fifth column. And what I think becomes clear if you study what Medvedev himself is saying is that he is more antagonistic in what he says towards the U.S. and towards U.S. policy towards Russia than is Putin himself at the moment. He says extremely strong things about the U.S. He is very critical of U.S. policy. And it is impossible to reconcile these views with any idea that he's any sort of fifth columnist. I'm going to make a further point, which I did not make in my article, because my article was already uh, covered a lot of ground. But it is this. You have not heard from any single member of the government, even coded language, which criticizes President Putin's foreign or defense policies at all. None of them has said anything which is at all critical of policy towards Syria. None of them has so much as hinted that they have any doubts about what was done with Ukraine in 2014. None of them have given any support to the Western agenda against Russia at all. They are simply people who believe in running an economy, the Russian economy, in a certain way. And that's all. Why does uh, Medvedev get such a bum rap? Why, why, is, he, why is he the, the poster boy for, for the fifth column? I think, first of all, uh, he, is a, he is a softer man than Putin is. I mean, he doesn't have Putin's charisma and drive. And when he was president, um, as a rather softer man, he had this, um, I think, disastrous idea that he could reach out to some of the people in Russia who are called non-system liberals. They are the kind of people we would call neoliberals and establish some sort of dialogue with them. And so he had some meetings with them, which went extremely badly in the end. It just it, it gave rise to expectations, which Medvedev himself had no interest and no ability to fulfill. But the fact that he did that, and the fact that the US, seeing that, thought that they could build him up as some kind of rival to Putin, has unfortunately damaged Medvedev's reputation and made very many people suspicious of him, I think unfairly. Who, who were these people that he tried to reach out to? Uh, like, were they in the government? Were they outside of the government? Who? They were outside the government. They were people effectively. I mean, he didn't actually meet with Navalny, but people like Navalny, people of that kind. Uh, and he, he, he did it, as I said, unwisely, in my opinion. He even hinted at various times that he was prepared to give some consideration to people like Khodorkovsky. And, of course, he, gave, uh, uh, he, he commissioned the Human Rights Council to look into the allegations of the Magnitsky, uh, uh, in the Magnitsky affair. Uh, all big mistakes. I think he's aware that they are big mistakes. And he's done nothing like that since he left the presidency. Um, uh, but it has left a mark of suspicion over him, which has never fully gone away. There, there, there's a lot of talk in Russia that, uh, that Putin doesn't uh, get, get along with uh, Medvedev, um, that they're adversaries at times, that uh, there's not a mutual respect. But here you have Medvedev once again as uh, prime minister. Uh, would you say that a lot of uh, those rumors are just that, rumors and gossip, and that the two men do actually work well together, or do you find some merit in a lot of what people say that uh, that Putin and Medvedev are not uh, don't see eye to eye? I, I think 
Yes, I think those rumours are straightforwardly wrong, actually. I think the two men get on very well with each other. Uh, there have been tensions in the past. When Medvedev was president, Putin disagreed with Medvedev publicly about Libya. Uh, Medvedev, and that was another reason why people are suspicious of Medvedev, that Medvedev was more critical of Gaddafi than I think Putin was prepared to be. But if you disregard that one in incident, there's never been any instance of Medvedev and Putin really falling out with each other. And if Putin had wanted to get rid of Medvedev, nothing would be easier for him to do than to have done it immediately after the last presidential election. And Medvedev is in no position to hold on or to challenge Putin in any way. So the fact that Putin reappointed him prime minister, to my mind, shows conclusively that he wants him there. And why shouldn't he? Because Medvedev's entire career has been one of unstinting and unflinching loyalty to Putin. He has been working with Putin for a very long time. They've been part of the same team. He's been Putin's lawyer at various times. Medvedev, uh, even many of his critics admit this, is a brilliant lawyer. Um, so I can't myself see that there is any real grounds for seeing a conflict between these two men, and I'm sure that there is none. Alexander, uh, you throw around the, you mention the term a lot uh, in your post, Atlantic integrationist. What's an Atlantic integrationist? Right, this is, this is an expression. I think the person who coined it is, is a very famous uh, and uh, interesting blogger called the Seika, which what he's referring to is a block of people within the government, within the Kremlin, who um, are essentially pro-American, want to uh, realign Russian policy alongside the US, want to repeat some of the policies that Russia followed in the 1990s, and who uh, sometimes he uses the word, the expression himself, uh, uh, amount to a fifth column. And he, that is to say, the Seika, tends to see uh, Medvedev as the leader of these Atlantic integrationists. I don't believe there is any such block in the Kremlin. I, I think that is a misreading of the situation. I think it is one that is, in fact, events have repeatedly shown is incorrect. And my article seeks to explain why. So I would imagine there is a, a fifth column in, in Russia somewhere. Um, as there is a fifth column in pretty much most uh, most countries around the world. Um, what is or where is this fifth column? Um, and it's, uh, you said it's not in the Kremlin. So where is it? Where is it operating? How close to the government is it in reality? How much power does it really have? Uh, what are the chances of it ever integrating Russia to to the Atlantic, uh, to the to the Western dogma and the Western uh, uh, side of side of things? You're absolutely right. There most definitely is a fifth column in Russia. I mean, I use that rather charged word, and one shouldn't perhaps use it too much. But there are definitely people in Russia who undoubtedly want to realign Russia with the West and return to some of the policies of the 1990s. Alexei Navalny, who we talked about before, he undoubtedly is someone who has those views. There are other people in the non-system opposition who also think like that. However, the main block of people who could be described as Atlantic integrationists are members of certain members of the business community. Um, and they're the people who uh, uh, dominate and, and control certain newspapers and certain television stations and who provide funding to the anti-government protests that take place from time to time, and they are there, and they are a voice. I think their influence is very considerably diminished over what it was, and I think it is declining, actually. I think that a new business community is emerging in Russia uh, uh, of younger people who no longer think in that way, and whose ideas are, are uh, directed towards a more patriotic, a, a, a more, if you like, sovereignist view of Russia's economic development. I think that the overwhelming majority of the population, that is what the recent election showed, 
reject these views entirely. I think Russia's uh, in, uh, military and security services, who are a powerful force in Russia, are of course completely opposed to all of this, and so is the foreign ministry. And I don't think there are many people in the Kremlin, in fact, I don't think there are any people in the Kremlin, in Putin's circle and in the government, who think like that either. So we are talking about a small number of people in the business community who retain a certain influence and a certain power, and a rather larger but still very limited number of, uh, of people of liberal, using you know the political liberal type of people, people like Navalny and uh, Xenia Sobchak, uh, um, who want to see uh, improved relations with the West, who are invariably, almost entirely concentrated in Moscow, and who are the people who make up the numbers at the street protests, which happen from time to time. But I, I don't think, as a political force, they amount to very much. And someone like Navalny, who, who, who you said is, is, is definitely looking towards aligning Russia more with the West, would it be fair to say, though, that he's not um, everything he's cracked up to be in the form that he's a liberal uh, person? Actually, he's, he's very much a nationalist. Would it be fair to call him a nationalist? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, actually, one should be a bit careful about Navalny because he, he uh, uh, combines certain liberal uh, positions with certain nationalist ones, uh, um, and almost, dare I say it, I mean, ethnicist, even racist nationalist positions at times. And um, one wonders how he would be able to reconcile these rather contra contradictory constituencies that he's trying to appeal right. to, if he was ever to gain any real prominence at all. Um, there are other people, uh, unlike Navalny, who are more, uh, um, more definitely liberal than he is. Um, so, uh, I mean, Sobchak, I, I'd say, is an example of this. It's Ksenia Sobchak, who was one of the people who was a candidate in the recent presidential election. Um, so, I mean, there are such people. I, if I just come back to Navalny, I think one of the reasons he takes these nationalist positions, um, I think, is because he realizes that these liberal if you like, fifth column positions are not popular in Russia and someone like his view, with his views has to transcend them by taking a more patriotic position on other things. I think um, the fact that he has contradictory positions on all these different things, however, also to a very great extent limits the support for him. Right, right, definitely. And, and finally, Alexander, give us your thoughts on, on two very, very famous, well-liked people that are also in, uh, in, in Putin's team, that being Lavrov and Shoigu. What, uh, what does that mean for Russia's foreign policy going forward? Well, I think uh, uh, Lavrov, if we turn to him, is the uh, um, outstanding foreign minister of the present time. I mean, I think he stands head and shoulders over all other diplomats. I think that it is widely acknowledged around the world that the greatest test of any diplomat is to withstand a meeting with Lavrov and come out of it intact. I mean, he's a man who has all the facts at his fingertips. He articulates Russia's position extremely clearly. He is very loyal to Putin. He is very loyal to Russia. He fights and represents Russia very effectively, and I think he will continue to do so, and he will do so in a consistent way. So we should not expect any change of Russian foreign policy, um, which has come to be embodied in the person of Sergei Lavrov. The other man that you mentioned, Sergei Shoigu, is uh, possibly the single most popular minister in the Russian government. He is, by all accounts, a brilliant manager. He is uh, uh, somebody that the defense and military establishment hugely admires and likes. He has been instrumental in reviving the confidence of the Russian military. And again, he is someone who is fully uh, identified, both in Russia and within the military and around the world, with the foreign and defense policies that Russia has been following and reappointing him is the clearest possible signal 
that they're not going to change. Right. right. Well, excellent analysis, Alexander, and thanks for clearing up a lot of uh, what's going on at the Kremlin and in Putin's uh, new government, which is very much the same government. Everybody, thanks for watching this video. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below. Click that notification bell to get notifications every time we push out a new video. And also visit drnshop.com. Pick up a shirt, get yourself a retro poster. Everything you buy helps the Duran stay active and stay posting uh, new news articles and videos. Take care, everybody. Alexander McCurse, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Thank you very much. Stay tuned for some more videos coming up real soon.